The history of India is as old as the history of mankind itself. As the concept of state and administration evolved in early India, justice administration was in line with the religious philosophy upheld by the ruling monarch. The earliest forms of societal control and regulation of human behaviour was governed by religious code of contact in the form of Manasmriti and Dharma Shastra, which was prevalent for most of the first millennium AD. After the advent of the Delhi Sultanate, laws in accordance with Sharia were enforced uniformly through the territories that fell within their empire. During Akbar's reign, Sharia laws continued to be enforced and made applicable to both Hindus and Muslim in respect of criminal law and to Muslim in respect to civil law. Though the emperor was the final authority, this was an era when administrative justice was effectively carried out by appointment of judges who tried both civil and criminal cases. The association of the Mughal dynasty with the Hindu Rajput kingdoms witnessed the prominence of secular laws during his reign. The East India Company set foot as traders and subsequently colonised India. The company was granted a charter by King George I in 1726 to establish Mayor's Court in the Presidency of Madras, Bombay and Calcutta. Judicial functions of the company expanded substantially after its victory in the Battle of Plassey in 1757 and by 1772 the company's jurisdiction expanded to other regions as well. In 1858 the British Crown took over all the territories which were under the control of the East India Company. Being part of the Empire saw the next big shift with the Indian legal system. Supreme Courts were established, replacing the existing mayoral courts. These courts were converted to the first High Courts through letters of patents authorised by the Indian High Courts Act passed by the British Parliament in 1862. Superintendents of lower courts and enrolment of law practitioners were deputed to the respective high courts. During the Raj, the Privy Council acted as the highest court of appeal. Cases before the council were adjudicated by the law lords of the House of Lords. The state sued and was sued in the name of the British Sovereign in her capacity as Empress of India. Until 1846, Indians were not allowed to practice before the Supreme Court and right of audience was reserved only for English, Irish and Scottish professional bodies. Subsequent rules and statutes culminating by the Legal Practitioners Act of 1846 opened up the profession regardless of nationality or religion. Coding of law, which was significantly colonial, began with the forming of the first Law Commission. Under the stewardship of its chairman, Thomas Babington Macaulay, the Indian Penal Code was drafted enacted and brought into force by 1862. The Code of Criminal Procedure was also drafted by the same commission. A host of other statutes and codes like Evidence Act 1872 and Contracts Act 1872. After independence in 1947, the Indian Constitution was drafted under the chairmanship of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, which became the basis and foundation of power and function of its state. The last 73 years since independence have been eventful for the Indian legal system, where the courts have formulated and enunciated a plethora of principles that have furthered the objectives and ideals enshrined in the constitution. Despite all the good that has been done, the judiciary is in need of major reforms. This documentary probes the various problems faced by people and the judiciary and wishes to address these problems by suggestion of certain idea is that we know we have three pillars, okay. the judiciary, legislative and the executive. The constitution has been written very clearly and then each powers have been demarcated very clearly. And all of us actually have a lot of regards and then trust and belief in the highest system of this governance, the judiciary. And we have the constitution which is very clearly written in terms of the trespassing of rights is actually 
happening and will happen and it's bound to happen and therefore you have the judiciary which will take care of that uh, trespass and violation especially of the citizen who's paramount important therefore uh, we as activists or as general citizens we think that the judiciary is prime important for all of us but uh, as day has been progressing we see there is this whole degeneration of values ethics morality principles and throwing of norms and laws by the judiciary in this country whereby the common man is has lost faith and still is losing faith in the judiciary which is actually a sad aspect we have very largely continued with the colonial form the colonial structure the colonial system and the colonial mindset we have been moved out from there and that is the same for the entire criminal justice system my frank opinion is the two things one is that i you know i need to blame my judiciary one is that, that, that i need to appreciate my judiciary the blame is basically which has you know if you go back to the uh, 90s or 20s you know that's 90s or uh, 2000 when the section 377 amendment was directly affecting the community saying that we are criminals before the constitution and that was quite difficult for us to digest in the same context uh, when we challenge this uh, uh, section before the delhi high court honorable delhi high court and that uh, time the delhi high court itself rejected the plea you know saying that no no the the, uh, the court can't hear the plea because this is something called human sexuality the amount of rejection made us so much of exclusion and people said it is pavitralaya people should not speak the word sex and when the pavitralaya becomes uh, so power, you know so super uh, station spaces for us then which is the space that we need to speak about this issue of sex, gender and sexuality. I need to thank the judiciary in 2009 why is that it has delivered a historical or a historical verdict saying that consensual sex between adults in privacy is not punishable and the judgment spoke about the constitutional morality and that's how the July 2nd we received a historical verdict across the globe the world was looking at the Indian Delhi High Court judgment. And after that, the, the so-called, you know, the, you know, like the religious fundamentalists who all came together fighting against human sexuality and human gender before the Supreme Court of India. And the 11, 12, 13 judgment has overruled and turned the Delhi High Court judgment is unconstitutional. And my question to the judiciary was and is, why did the Indian judiciary First, we were criminals and we made us decriminalization and again we were made the re-criminals. I think it's a shame on the democracy. I think the freedom nation cannot accept this. The republic of the country cannot accept this. Why I need to say this? No country has a power. No political leaders, no legislators, no parliament, not even the judiciary has the power to recriminalize one section. Because we are the most affectors, we are the most marginalized, we are the most oppressed section of society, and we are struggling with gender and sexuality. I think somewhere the judiciary itself need to understand the depth, the politics, the identity, the diversity, the fluidity, which has to be in a, in a you know, you know, like brought into its curriculum to speak about this issue. I would say the judicial system has failed. It is uh, functioning and it is uh, doing fairly well. But that's not to say that you know there's no need for change. There's plenty of uh, room for change. What ails the judiciary? Delay. Justice delayed is justice denied. Data shows that the average time taken for a case to be disposed is approximately three years in the 21 high courts of the country and six years in the subordinate courts. On an average, 1.7 cruel cases are filed every year in the various courts in the country and less than half the number are disposed. So in our culture, in our society here, what is happening is punishment by process. The judicial process itself is enough of a punishment. And by the time the sentence is handed on, it's a joke. It's one for 20 years, 25 years, you know, egregious um, uh, caste violences. And everybody is uh, acquitted. There is no, 25 people are killed in a caste conflagration and there's nobody to, uh, you know, hold responsible. It's a joke. 
that is how lack of access to justice is in our country in the few pils that we have been uh, pursuing with the high courts we see that there is so much laxity on the part of the judges to even uh, pass uh, uh, you know uh, laws or uh, ask the government to enforce laws which are prima facie not being implemented whether it's in the case of the ward committees or in the case of the area sabhas that are not functioning anywhere so we find that laxity and uh, also we definitely see collusion between some bureaucrats and the judiciary that the some highly placed bureaucrats are able to influence judiciary to not listen to citizens voices and to give pro government uh, rulings in the contemporary scenario where we are at the moment i am given to understand uh, that it's the delay in delivery of justice uh, that is uh, an acute shortage with the current judicial system over the course of last few years we've seen uh, delays happening in very prominent cases and that's why perhaps uh, the general population in the country is losing trust in the judicial system take for example nirbhaya it's been about 7 years and all we see is petitions on petitions and these are terms that perhaps the common people don't understand a curative petition a mercy petition so on and so forth so what people essentially see is a system that is plagued with delay and that results in frustration that results in deficit of trust and i am sorry to say this but today we see an acute deficit of trust in the judicial system and as a result of which what happens is Uh, people start believing in extrajudicial killings they start believing in taking law in their own hand and that's exactly what happened in case of hyderabad uh, where the accused remember uh, not convicted the accused uh, four accused who were believed to have gang raped a woman uh, were killed by the police and people all across the country celebrated that i think primarily the justice delivery system is uh, a too time consuming uh because it is time consuming it's very expensive third is it is unpredictable both in terms of the law applicable and also the uh procedure applicable there are approximately 3 crore cases pending in various courts and the judge population ratio is 10.5 to 1 million and should ideally be 50 to 1 million in a densely populated country such as india as well as the judge population ratio is concerned um now after my article came that there were a lot of discussions there were you know some senior advocates calling me to say that more judges really don't mean uh, better uh, and more effective disposals i said how do you know we haven't tried it and if you go to talk about 2 to 3 crore uh, cases I don't see this the problem being solved without more judges. When when was the last time you saw a paper report which talked about vacancies in magistrates courts or vacancies in the municipal court or vacancies in the district court? Why does media not talk about it at all? Why are the difficulties of people uh, in the lower judiciary not discussed to the media? I mean the chief justice of uh, india sits on a motor bike it becomes a uh, news all over the country and why are you not talking about uh, uh, the person who the, who is the lower strata of society what is he doing how effectively are those institutions being run why is there no discussion at all when interviewed justice chandru a former judge of the madras high court opined that the more the matters get clogged the frustration of the litigant increases Therefore any attempt to reform the judiciary should be to have justice delivery system to be tuned to become faster and effective. While in service Justice Chandru disposed around 96,000 cases in 7 years. He ensured order copies were issued within no time and matters were listed on mere mentioning of the same. Old matters were taken on chronological order and for new and urgent matters particularly day and time were fixed no distinction between senior and junior were made and all cases were shown due importance delay 
is one of the major drawbacks that beset the judiciary and the use of technology can reduce the burden. Technological interventions such as usage ICT has proven to be an effective intervention in curbing judicial delays. The moment you are reducing human touch uh, from any system, you are ensuring efficiency. So technology, yes, I mean, especially in court, and, and since I've had the, the good luck of observing the court proceedings very closely in NGT and sometimes in, in Delhi High Court, uh, we still see that it's still pen to paper, it's still a lot of manual labor, and that I think needs to change very fast and I'm sure uh, people who are experts in this can ensure that technology uh, is brought in in every juncture, in every uh, process that there is in the law, uh, in, in law abiding, in, in law formulating and the delivery of justice. I think if the technology is used in filing and allotment and all of that, hopefully that will make uh, things more transparent and accountable. We're not dependent on uh, you know, individual manual officers to approve or disapprove certain filings or certain defects. It can just be automated. Uh, uh, listing, for example, in court can be automated once your filing is done. Um, so all of that can certainly help. Um, and uh, I think e-filings, a lot of courts have already initiated that. That should uh, make access to documents that are filed uh, ultimately, we should also use technology to make it make things more accessible to litigants, um, you know, so that they know what's happening with their case. We need technological uh, upgradation. We need integration of technology into the systems. For example, I would say at every level, starting from the municipal court to the district court to the high court to the supreme court, there must be statistics of how many cases a judge has disposed of in a particular month, in a particular week, how many days has he gone on leave, right? Everything must be available for public scrutiny. As they say, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Therefore, the more and more uh, information that you put on public domain, uh, more and more uh, efficient the system will become. E-courts have already come into existence since 2005. Um, I think the backlogs and all have already been uh, uh, computerized and they're available. That's a great step because uh, what happens when we're moving ahead, generally the backlog gets neglected and they're just left out. So that's a huge injustice. So at least the backlogs are there. It is there for the judges to see, the court officers to see. Um, so it helps that way to a great extent. Poor infrastructure and access to justice. The budget allocation for the judiciary is a miserly 0.2% of the GDP in India. The ex-Chief Justice said that courts in the country lack basic infrastructure for judges, court staff and litigants that end up contributing to arrears and backlogs of cases. The World Justice Report ranks India as 69th position out of 128 surveyed nations on four variables that constitute the rule of law, accountability, just laws, open government, and access to justice. In most of the courts in India, it is sort of fixing matters or like merry-go-rounds or musical chairs. The first part of it is when we reach the courts. Okay, the police somehow or the other, you do this, do that, and somewhere get a case actually registered but you come to court and look at the system that is available there just now and also for the last 60 70 years a system of fear a system that is too far away for me to touch and of course they will not touch they will look down their noses a system that makes is there just to make my life much more miserable with no vision or even a thought to justice. First sentence anybody hears when we talk of a case, don't take it to court. Is it possible for you to sort it out here? But how is it that you can't be amicable and dialogue and converse and sort it out? Don't go to court. And I think uh, people don't go to courts because they say it is laborious. Then they don't trust. They also say that uh, they will not get justice because the powers that be are different. So I cannot have a lawyer, I cannot have a judge. 
So therefore they think the judiciary is a part that they can't touch. Thereby they lose on the rights, they lose on the responsibility and large discontentment among the large masses that we go. I'm a person who's also involved in training of judges, particularly in the area of uh, sexual harassment, gender sensitivity and all that. And I find shocking uh, levels of uh, lack of knowledge in, in the judicial system entirely. Now, I'm not only talking about judges, but also judicial officers, lawyers themselves. Many of the times, lawyers have very traditional and conservative positions. And whereas our law is actually quite progressive and liberal in many ways. And in many ways, um, the legislature, uh, the legislation often precedes, you know, social uh, opinion or practice. So I think uh, that kind of the dynamic between how society views an issue, uh, how the uh, what the law says, and how it is interpreted and practiced, that kind of dynamic is very important, particularly when you're talking about people who lack access to justice. Justice Chandru, when asked about the roster and the problems with it opined that automation and systematization may bring some efficiency to increase the ranking. The master of roster should scrupulously prepare the roster in such a way that it guarantees efficient disposal of matters by competent judges. He also opines that the judge concerned wield appropriate control over the registry and can dispose matters and provide copies quickly. Corruption and lack of transparency. Issues are there, problems are there, um, laws are very well framed. Uh, but if we see the basic uh, premise of our society, it is based on inequality. And so when, you, when you're based on inequality, whether it be class, caste or gender, when it is entirely based on inequality, where is the question of seeking for equality by the law? Okay, so the basis is inequality. Now, when I say that, I mean that uh, corruption in the judiciary is there. It is no doubt about it. It is not just financial corruption. We see it at all stages. You know, the police, the writer will not write unless something is passed. And we don't do it. He takes his own time. I don't know the language. I don't know how to write this. That man has to come to write it. This man has to come. So there are different ways in which they tell you that you have to pay the money. On the other side is our people. If the police don't ask also, our people will put 50 rupees in his pocket. You know, so this whole thing is so ingrained that this, without corruption, without oiling the system, it will not work. So that is one kind of corruption. Then you know about that justice, uh, what was his name, that judge... Uh, you must have read or heard about the kind of assets that he had when he was just a sitting judge. He his bathrooms, his kitchens, his uh, were the, with the best of tiles and all that from public money. The towels that he used, each each thing was valued. We had written an article on it at that time. We used to bring out a paper called The Voice of People Awakening. So that time we brought out each part by part of his house and the value of it. And for a sitting judge to have that kind of a mansion almost is the sign of corruption. He first went to reading Arthashastra of Chanika. He makes that, you know, uh, there should be provision of some percentage uh, for corruption. Correct. In the sense that, he says that uh, in the society we live in, mm. some amount of pilferage is expected to happen. Correct. He says that uh, how to, uh, it more comes to how to make a king relevant mm. to the society in those days. Mm. He says the people need to know, keep, they must be kept reminding that of your existence. Correct. They must be kept reminding of your superiority. Mm. They must be kept reminding of your magnificence, of your place, Correct. thing and all that stuff. How are you going to do that? He says that certain amount of funds need to be used mm. for a development what is visible to the people. So for example, visibility was the more important. Correct. China says what is visible in a village? Mm. Visible in a village is a temple, visible in is a tank, visible in a village is a chowdhury. Three things which are there. So he says that these three things you need to invest. Mm. How can a king invest all that money and all the little be, he'll be? At those times, it's not possible. Mm. He says it's not necessary that you should invest all the money. Mm. What you can do is, you can appoint somebody who is a head there, village headman who is there, okay. who will collect nearly 60 to 70 percent of the funds mm. for this program mm. by way of taxes, contribution, whatever the means okay. it is. Okay. 
from his or that. Mm. All that you require to do is some 35 to 40 percent max. Mm. Depends upon the position, the land, fertility, and all that. If the land is very fertile, you can increase it to 80 percent from them or 20 percent from you, or whichever the way. Mm. But you always make a provision mm. that the whatever the percentage you give, mm. 10 percent is meant for that team Correct. which executes this. Correct. That money is going to go. Incentivize. It has an advantage. It's an incentive kind of a thing. Mm. Though you are not going to say it's an incentive, though it's going to be corruption, mm. hmm, this guy is going to pilferage that kind of money. Correct. Allow that to happen because he is the guy who is going to talk to the people about you. Correct. Correct. Now, this is something which is institutionalized construct which we have already have in existence. Correct ages ago, 2100 years ago to be precise, or much more than that, 2300 plus years. Now, given that kind of uh, understanding that uh, we have, we see another instance of that in uh, impeachment of uh, Robert Clive in Correct. British Parliament. Correct. He says that the possibility of corruption is so much, you must appreciate my moderation. <laughs> so now we live in a country of that nature. Kempo Manishya, Kempo Mukadavan Hogi, Kari Mukadavan Kai Gadi Kara Bodhi. It's not like that. 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 Birmingham in the Kabina Tarsoro. ये जेल के लिए ये क्या ना बेकार तो सर ये देना बनो तो बंद महिला उनके उनको अपने कुशामत के अंदर शुरू करो यारो दर्द को तो ना ना उनको उनको कुशामत को अंदर शुरू करो हाँ शुरू वक्त है सो व्हेन यू टॉक ऑफ करप्शन विद इस जुडिशियल सिस्टम आई थिंक देवर वाज अ स्टडी दैट वाज मेड इन 1998 और 9 व्हि� Whereas we thought, you know, it was the police, it was the excise department, it was the revenue department, it was some other department. Certainly not the judiciary. But then the study revealed that it was and is till date the judiciary. And that is why the judiciary needs to be pulled up. There need to be structural changes that need to be made. There need to be policy changes and budgetary changes. Because we can see how the judges, magistrates, the judiciary lives and see how the prosecution lives, see how the police live. They have, large chunks of their budget has been given away to these people. For what? To give judgments that is not at all justified? And that is unacceptable. See, it is mental construct. Passed on from generation to generation. Especially during British rule, uh, the concept of uh, corruption which we did. That doesn't mean that prior to that it was not there, it was there, but it, it, it was uh, restricted to ruling class and rulers. It's around that. Now it has become a common phenomenon everywhere. It is percolated down, down to people level. All spheres of life. Judiciary is also equally equal. Judges interpret uh, uh, legal provisions, constitutional provisions, according to their own uh, thinking. And in fact, it is an unfortunate to uh, say that uh, the judges were, the advocates and also judges, especially judges were, their cultural lens through, through that they see constitutional provision. That itself is a big problem. And it, that is also corrupt practice. Looking at constitutional provisions, legal provisions through their traditional lens, through their cultural lens itself is corruption. And it's big, much bigger corruption, which damage the entire morality, constitutional morality. Justice Chandru opines, drawbacks of the Indian judiciary system are many. The system requires a complete overhaul. Right from the system of appointment of judges, training of judges and lawyers, everything requires a change. Those who have a certain degree of privilege can make such a statement. It's like that. 
So I am I'm, I'm in a very fairly comfortable situation. I am able to say I don't want corruption in society. I can happily say this. Correct. But somebody who is absolutely in a miserable condition, they would enjoy it. It's not possible for him to talk the same language you do. Correct. If you said that to help with corruption, she would be in a much miserable condition than what he is. Correct. So somewhere we should look from that perspective. Yes. So when you say what should the public do, well, public also has to eat and live. How many times can we come to the streets demonstrating, protesting, demanding answers, which just say, yes, you will get it in the next six weeks. How do you get this en masse movement to come back six weeks later to demonstrate again? So what about the system of me paying my tax and you being answerable to me? It's a very simple equation. So why have you forgotten this equation? What about my Lokpal? You have people from the government, within the government, who are actually supposed to book the people who are corrupt within the government. It is a closed door right now, where people have no access to what is happening within those closed doors. There needs to be greater transparency within the judiciary. For instance, they have been uh, very often saying we don't even want to come under the RTI Act and they have been refusing to uh, give information on uh, several things that uh, people have been asking. I think uh, whatever courtroom, uh, you know, like arguments happens or judgment happens, that needs to be direct live, yeah, because parliament sessions are the direct live and why there is so much of confidentiality within the court hall? I think let it be in the public, you know, and we were expecting this when the section 3 sense and what it came actually, if that was there, people were directly watching, you know. I think definitely that is very much required. You know? Use of information and communication technology such as e-filings and virtual court hearings through video conferencing etc can bridge the gap and increase judicial efficacy. Technology has amazing advantages unlike this. For example, with the, as some young lawyer uh, and somebody who was working in a corporate, especially in the, the reality businesses, we, we have seen securing a uh, land record of rights one has to pay through nose. People have paid nearly 15,000, 20,000 rupees for a binary copy in 1990s. If you can imagine the volume of money. In fact, some of them have become really millionaires, the village accountants, by just giving certificate copies of this document. Now, this technology has, today with the kind of technology we have, it's a kiosk, you go and apply and get it. There is still ways they make it. It's not that it's gone. But at least it has reduced to a larger extent. It makes it more transparent, more accessible. And we can also ask raise issues, questions. The e-courts have already come into existence since 2005. Um, I think the backlogs and all have already been uh, uh, computerized and they're available. That's a great step. Independence of the judiciary. There is no uniformity in the method of appointment of judges in India and judges in India are appointed by the collegium system wherein judges appoint judges which endangers democracy. In many democratic countries uh, across the world, there is an open process of appointing judges and the executive also has a role in that. Of course, given the kind of executive that we have had, it's very... Uh, it's easy to understand that the judiciary wants, doesn't want to have any say uh, for the executive in their appointments. We often hear that uh, the selections are not transparent and such things. There should be a transparent process like uh, the IAs, IPS, IRS, uh, the top bureaucracy comes from the civil service. Uh, likewise, I feel there should be a judicial service uh, where merit is uh, you know, tested and yes, the selection is based on merit. I don't know. Yes, there was a proposal. It's not there now. The thing that is to see, it starts from the appointment itself. Representation from various sections of society itself. You see, there are less of Dalits there. No women that we see in the judiciary. Therefore, in a country like us, that you know, you should have large representation of people of the mass that is there. They are eligible and they can be there. And that is one of the things that I foremost would say. If you look at the political arena, you find dynasty. You look at the judicial arena, you find dynasty. You find that my father's father, who was a judge or a lawyer, is only the same one. No, it's guaranteed legacy that I will become a judge. 
doesn't matter about my caliber, my professionalism. I become this judge with the same mindsets. And the, the kind of standards that I used to appoint judges, literally they are holy cow, you cannot question them. And for some reason, my constitution has given them this discretionary power, which they use indiscriminately. The law says, this accused cannot get bail under this law. How do you give bail? Look at the number of cases that have got bail under POXO, when POXO is so clear that you cannot get bail. Look at the number of rapists who have got bail, when the rape law says that they cannot get bail. Because very often, uh, the kind of judges who have been appointed, uh, they have not made uh, very glorious names for themselves. Their record should also be open. Why a judge was rejected, was not appointed to the Supreme Court, or why somebody was appointed, I think citizens need to know a little bit more. It is important for the judiciary to be independent without any external influence in line with the idea of separation of powers. When asked about the influence of the executive and the functioning of the judiciary, Justice Chandru stated, The increased influence of executive over the judiciary is alarming. We do not have many judges who stand up against executive encroachment. We mostly have looking forward judges than forward looking judges. He also proposes that judges should not be allowed to practice after retirement. The judiciary needs to be more diverse today. Um, we've no, we don't yet see great diversity. Uh, we need judges at all levels. Um, judges who we need more women judges. We need more judges with disabilities. Uh, we need uh, judges which come from different caste backgrounds. Um, so we need, uh, you know, of course, uh, we need the judges to represent the diversity that uh, our litigants and our, uh, you know, people are. So you can't identify judiciary as the only reason for the purpose of uh, because the judiciary deals with hardly 5% of the population or maybe 10% of the population. It doesn't deal with the rest. Whereas administration in today's concept uh, deals with everybody who is in the, this thing. You know? Therefore administration also should understand that you are there to serve people and you are not a master of the people. The main definition of democracy is government of the people, by the people, for the people. It's people friendly facing. Therefore, you are there not as a headmaster, but as a person who is to facilitate good things to happen in the life of the citizens. That's why you are there, for which you are compensated substantially. Therefore, you got to do your job. If you think that you are the master because you have been made an IAS officer or a thing, uh, you are totally wrong. Would there be a more uh, um, open way of selecting the judges and of also holding them accountable? Now, there is a very uh, difficult process if you want to remove a judge also. There is not a proper, uh, very easy process for removing them. The Raja Sabha passed the 120 Amendment Bill in 2013 that amends Article 124.2 and 217.1 of the Constitution and established the National Judicial Appointments Commission. The amendment was struck down by the Supreme Court for being unconstitutional on 16th of October 2015. Justice Chandru opines, I'm for appointing judges by NJAC system. The NJAC system may consist of some civilian representation. I think, see, people have to know that everybody has rights in that. Mm. You don't allow the naughty fellow to actually rule, then you will actually stay out. This is your country. Look at what democracy means. Your direct participation, your indirect participation also. Therefore, you have both ways. If there are dirty people, I think you have to sweep. You have to sweep, whether it's in the judiciary, whether it's in the politics, other things. It's like a house. If you have dirt and then even if there's dirt there in your house, you don't sit quiet. One day you keep going, second day you at least sweep it and then take it off. I think you need to come on the street, you need to come in your homes, stand outside and then brush these people. So I think everybody needs to come, they should understand, no bystanders. Technology is non-functional without human intervention and yet the very same factor of human intervention inherently increases the probability of fading ethics. When I was young I lived in a society which boycotted people who went to jail, who committed offences, 
of the various types. Consequently, their own families also used to sort of stay away from such people. Things have changed so much. Today we find people going to jail, taking a bail and coming out. And there are thousands of people who are willing to receive that person. This indicates that the society has lost all its moral values. I was thinking whether it is possible to change it by changing our laws. Then I realized laws do not change these things. For example, China has death sentence for corruption. In India, it's only seven years imprisonment. But in the list of honest countries prepared by Transparency International, a German organization which makes assessment of honesty in different countries, China is far below India also, in spite of the sentence being death sentence. The main thing that is there in our country is moral corruption. Yes. Financial corruption is everywhere. Yes. Okay, in the world all over it is there. But moral and social corruption is based on our caste system and our thinking within it. You know, so the, the, the minute this hierarchy has come in in our thinking, and it shows very easily in the kind of cases taken up by the judges, then we go about, uh, you know, say women, say rape victims, say women who are the victims. We see it very clearly how the woman is re-victimized again and again. So at the stage of the police station, it is one where she is made to answer, asked all kinds of, a rape victim, a rape, uh, a girl of ours who's been raped at the age of 16. So she, the way she, she's treated at the police station, the kind of questions you're not supposed to ask is asked. Then she's taken to the kind of, uh, the medical uh, examination. She had to have an abortion. So she had that abortion privately and then went. When she goes there, she's asked by the gynae, oh, so you've already had an abortion. So it means you want to be raped again. You see, so that dirt. Then you go to the judiciary. Then you file a case in the court. First of all, it comes under POXO. Under POXO also, it is so demeaning, you know. When you say fast track courts, you say all kinds of things, special courts, everything. There, the lawyer and the judges, the opposing lawyer tells her, why don't you go home nicely and stay with them? He's willing to look after you. The judge says that, why are you creating so many problems? You know, it's always by and by. You have heard of all those cases where the judge said, have Bene Dosha and come. Yes. The domestic violence will get over. Or uh, why is the unmarried lawyer fighting a marital case? I mean, all these aspersions and dialogue and all that happens is all a sign of our, uh, the mental backwardness, the cultural backwardness that is there. Whether it be the topmost lawyer in the Supreme Court, now you have this <laughs> and sexual harassment, where the topmost Supreme Court lawyer, or it be the bottommost clerk in the courts, or it be the lawyers, or it be the judges, or it be all of us, the bottommost line is the kind of caste, uh, casteist, feudal uh, mentality we still have. And that comes from keeping a society unequal. If you ask me what is citizen perspective action, it's such a lot. It's so much because we've just exchanged our uh, British Babus for uh, Indian Babus and uh, the Raj continues and I feel so sad, very angry and outraged. The sun has not yet set on the Queen's empire. Countries such as Sri Lanka, Ghana and Brazil rank better than India in terms of transparency and access to justice and have instilled certain practices or behavioural moulds such as pledges taken more often, public access to court proceedings and increased public participation in appointment and impeachment of judges who, which have reduced instances of corruption. Moral courage is, um, say, is saying um, that wrong things are wrong, condemning wrong things, uh, even when it doesn't suit you. That applies to everybody. Uh, of course, in, in bureaucracy also, there are so many things. People sp keep speaking of pressures, no? The police officers say, we have a lot of pressure from higher-ups. What prevents them from standing up and resisting that pressure? That requires moral courage. Maximum, what will happen? You may get transferred. So be prepared to sacrifice something, some sacrifice some pleasure or comfort that you may have and, and stand up for the right things. Nothing will happen if you are, only if you err on the wrong side you can be punished. 
if you are following law and somebody is putting some wrong kind of illegal pressure you will not be punished in any way for not doing it maximum that can happen is transfers which are which are not a you know a tra- punishment i don't consider transfers as punishment the definition of government service is public servant public service that doesn't mean demean that you are a servant in that kind of concept this thing you know but you are there to discharge your duties which is meant for the welfare of the people but then unfortunately things have changed because today that status has become so very respected i keep saying today society respects money and power how you acquire money how you acquire power it is not bothered about it is least bit bothered about that so in that background unless administration becomes people friendly for which the attitude of the people there which should be that of a person who is willing to serve not master them so the whole question is not just this or that it's in a entire system systemic uh, change that has to come and that has to come only from all of us also individually changing you know so and giving the scope for others who have changed we we to crowd them once they change we say so for everyone no hope there is people like bavari devi there are th- 1500 gang rape survivors who are today leading their life so there is hope we all want a, a reform in the judiciary that takes place as early as possible before we lose the faith in the largest and the single most important institution in this country we are in very bad shape i can only con- uh, confess that uh, we the elders now i am 65 uh, i think during our period mm. we have created lot of chaos and confusions mm. we distracted the society i confess that to younger generation that i'm sorry uh, i think you are the one you can actually take up this issue and you 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 manage this younger generation i can only appeal to younger generation look at this seriously and protect the constitution yeah. implement the constitution this is what i can say despite the shortcomings the judiciary has indeed passed several progressive judgments with regard to the rights of women and LGBT community in the recent year and has evolved to the changing societal needs. Judicial reforms and increased public participation would indeed result in increased efficiency of the judiciary. The judiciary still remains the last resort and hope for all the citizens of India to uphold the principles enshrined in the constitution.